The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Setting up policies with the corporation on how to approach the search, depending on what areas they get. So I'm going to give you this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to the uh, great organizers of um, SELF for having a wonderful show here in Sparkle City. Uh, uh, once again, having a great time. Um, it's actually, my talk is actually a little bit policy light, um, so we can certainly go into that. Um, it's actually, my whole talk is actually kind of light, but um, we have, it's about 30 minutes, so there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. You can interrupt me if you want, or you can um, wait till the end. Um, I'm, I'm Nick Owen. You can get me on Twitter at Wicked Systems. Um, it's my corporate account. Um, and we're on Pound Wicked on Freenode as well. Um, everything I talk about is, is we have copies of it on our website. Um, so I recommend if you, you know, don't worry too much about the details, get the, get the vibe of the whole thing. Um, I'm going to talk about um, securing your network um, with open source technologies and trying to meet some policies and regulations that you might need to. Uh, there's a little bit of philosophy and strategy, a little bit of specifics, and um, hopefully it's enough to get you guys really interested in increasing your security. So who remembers the good old days? Um, you know, when you had a firewall that meant you were secure. Uh, it wasn't actually that long ago, and it was quite easy. You might get a virus, but that was sort of it. You know, the only attacks, really, uh, that the bad guy could do would be a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, it, was, it was a pretty simple sort of threat landscape. Today, though, uh, it's different. Um, you still have to have your firewall. It may not be doing as much good as it used to, uh, but you still need it. Your users could be at a Starbucks over a Wi-Fi connection of some sort. Uh, you might be deploying Google Apps, and your users would actually be you know, potentially attack between Google Apps and the, wi the Starbucks Wi-Fi connection, and you wouldn't even know it. Um, so it's a much more complex threat landscape today than it was in the past. Additionally, you might have um, some security services that you're using outside of your firewall. Um, as an example, you might be using SMS for authentication. And there are a lot of people doing this, and I think they're doing it without realizing that they've changed their threat landscape. So now your SMS carrier is in the middle of your threat landscape. Uh, and if you are AT&T and you made it slightly harder to reset a password, you're going to increase your help desk calls by millions. So they're not incented in any way to increase the security of their SMS system. Um, I think if anyone, and I, I think particularly I'm picking on AT&T, but you should ask Jeremy Sands how he feels about AT&T this weekend. So it's a, lot, it's a lot more complex, and um, what, what I think one thing you need to do today is really think about your, is that too loud? Just me, okay. Um, think about the threat landscape and what you're doing. Um, what people didn't really realize was that RSA was doing authentication as a service. The service they were providing was not leaking the shared secrets um, until they got attacked and leaked the shared secrets. So these things are worthwhile considering. But it's not just the threat landscape that's changed, right? Who here is uh, with a company that's under PCI or HIPAA or SOX compliance? So <clears throat> there are a lot of things that um, I'm, I'm personally of the opinion. So there's a, the debates about PCI. Is it, is it creating a ceiling or is it a floor? I'm seeing a lot of people that are coming up to the floor. So overall, I think it's a, a good thing, um, particularly when credit cards are involved. Um, but there's some things you would do for PCI compliance or compliance that are beyond security. Um, in addition to all this, in addition to the, all the stuff you've got to secure, you've got your users involved, right? And so that could be problematic as well, right? Because the users are also in a world of pain these days. You know, they've got passwords for Facebook, they've got passwords for Sony PlayStation, they've got passwords for um, Gawker Media, just to name a couple of them. Um, someone did a study recently of the passwords from Sony and the passwords from Gawker Media. 
and found that a, an astounding percentage of them were reused across, across just those two properties. So, you know, clearly passwords are a 20th century technology, um, and it's time for change, and luckily there are some solutions for that. So, philosophically, we're going to try and get you into a better state, right? Because, in general, um, from a security perspective, things are pretty rough right now. Um, I, I want you to think about balance. Um, one of the things we've tried to do is to, you know, tech, strong, strong authentication historically has been fairly expensive and fairly difficult to use. Um, bringing down the expense gives you budget to do other stuff, um, which gives you a better balance. Keep it simple. Um, I'm sure you guys are probably, uh, you know, managing some legacy code that you would um, have preferred had been architected differently. So think about the next guy that comes in and needs to manage your uh, network. Um, but in general, we'll talk a lot about protocols and how if you really limit yourself in the protocol world, you'll get a lot more flexibility. Defense in depth. There's a lot of stuff we could do here. I could cover, you know, go on, well, you could go to an information security conference here about all this stuff. Um, but in general, you know, you want strong authentication. You want encrypted tunnels that are strong. You want to encrypt your data. You want to monitor. You want to back up. You want to log. Um, and, you know, that's really what you need to do. Because if you have something that the attacker wants to get, chances are they can get it. What you want to do is minimize the amount of time they have to do that, um, minimize their ability to get out, um, and just always keep in mind that you know, the value of your data is probably staying the same or increasing. The cost of attacks is dropping. Um, and I'm a big believer in optimization too, right? So I think, I think uh, this is probably pre preaching to the choir because Linux enthusiasts are very good at getting a lot for very little. Um, but automation is key, and I've got a couple of tips and tricks for, or one, one, tip, one tip for uh, automation. So let's talk about strong authentication. This is really my area, I guess, of expertise. Um, if you're not looking at doing some proprietary system, um, then uh, certs and keys are, are two options. Um, certificates have been an option for a long, long time, and nobody has done them. So there's obviously some issues around that. Um, I think management has been a big nightmare for them. Um, managing whitelists and blacklists is quite difficult. But from a payoff standpoint, it's not quite fair either. You know, there's offline brute force attacks with a passphrase. So if someone gets the certificate, they can spend all day dictionary brute, for brute forcing attacking it, and when they get it, they're in. Um, do you know there's a passphrase? What's the quality of the passphrase? Actually, now that I think about it, this is kind of dated. Um, you know, a GPU-based password cracker uh, will destroy a, any kind of passphrase. So no matter how complex your passphrase is, if you've got a GPU cluster, you can break it. Um, and you can rent them. So um, pretty much everyone has one. Uh, to me, the real issue here from an um, enterprise standpoint is integration across applications. You know, you might be able to use um, certs very easily for a web app, but what about SSH? Uh, what about your VPN? What if you want to switch your VPN from a Cisco to a Juniper? Will they still work? Um, so there's a lot of pain, and, and you know, even if, they're free, even if you roll your own certificate authority, there's, there could be a lot of pain. Um, SSH keys, this is another great example. I you know, love them. It's a great technology. use them all the time, but they're audit issues. Um, is there really a passphrase? What's the key expiration system? Um, you know, the new versions of OpenSSH will require a, cli a client that has a passphrase, but do you know how long the passphrase is? Do you know that someone hasn't recompiled <laughs> the uh, client to say that it has a passphrase when it doesn't? And I guess the other issue with SSH and, and search as well is that one of the things I recommend and a, a policy you should have is have all your users in one place, uh, even if that's Active Directory. So it's very easy to disable your users. And ideally, I recommend uh, that you have HR disable your users rather than a sysadmin, uh, so that the control is really where it needs to be. So obviously, consider the source. I'm a little bit biased, but I think one-time passwords are, are what you need to be looking at. Um, and primarily, that's because passwords work everywhere. Right? Every application has a prompt for a username and password, uh, pretty much. So all you really need to do, then, is focus on the back end. I want an application that'll work with, um, with, with my systems. So this is the question we get quite a lot, right, which is, you know, do you work with my, will you work with my Cisco? Will you work with my Juniper? Will you work with my Citrix setup? 
Um, and it's a valid question, right? You want stuff that works. But I would like for you to take a little bit more of a strategic approach for it and have uh, really thought about what your network topology should be and come, and come to the conclusion that, oh yes, well my, network, my, my uh, networking protocol for authentication is RADIUS. I see that you support RADIUS so there'll be no problems, correct? Um, because really, at the network protocol layer, that's where you want to have your standard. This will allow you to swap equipment very easily and it won't really matter whether you're using OpenVPN or Cisco because you can change those out without, without, without having to significantly re re rework your, your network. <clears throat> so there's, uh, I guess, a couple of options here. TACAX is in here. We support TACAX Plus. Uh, it's really a Cisco proprietary protocol. If you have a lot of switches and networking equipment, you may be familiar with it. Um, but there's not really much open source support for it because of the fact that it's a Cisco proprietary protocol. Um, I prefer RADIUS. We'll talk about RADIUS a good bit. Uh, LDAP is lightweight only in relation to X509, in my opinion. Um, and while I would love to say, hey, listen, if you only use one pro uh, networking protocol in your network, you'll be rock solid. In point of fact, you probably won't be able to. Um, and that's because if you move to any kind of cloud services, you'll have to use something like SAML. Um, and SAML is one of those standards where everybody be, can be compliant and nobody would still work together. So I've got a little, one little uh, piece about SSO for you all as well. Um, why do I like RADIUS? Because it's simple. Um, it just works. You really typically need only um, three pieces of information, the server, the port, which is uh, 1812 UDP, and a shared secret. Uh, RADIUS is an encoded protocol, so this is really a LAN um, um, protocol. Uh, it's a very standard standard. You can, um, uh, you know, it'll work with PFSense, it'll work with you know, Cisco, Juniper, uh, Citrix, it, it, just, it just works. Um, you can start off with your open VPN server, and if you grow to need more, you can plop in a Cisco or a, v a Juniper box, and, and you're good to go. Um, you, you, it's simple, but you can expand it through access control lists and return attributes, you could do a lot with Radius. And Free Radius is a great open source product. Uh, Radiator is another one. So there's some really good enterprise level inexpensive options out there. Um, I say even Microsoft supports Radius off now. That's kind of a bit of unfair. They've been supporting since 2003. The ability to um, accept Radius uh, packets and proxy them to a third party server. So you can have your PFSense BSD firewall send RADIUS packets to your Active Directory server in the IAS or NTS plugin, validate that the user is active in Active Directory and in the proper group, and if so, it will send it to your Linux-based two-factor authentication server. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. So I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit specifics here. I've got two tricks, really, that'll help you get a lot done in your network. Um, the first one is PAM. How many people have played with PAM files before? Did you like it or did you hate it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, after this week of struggling with some PAM requests from customers, I'm kind of not on the um, uh, love side so much anymore. But um, if you can figure it out and get it working, don't ever make any changes again. Um, it's great. You can really do a lot with PAM. SSH, obviously, but sudo. Um, as well, which I highly recommend. Uh, you can even do login, um, SFTP, a lot of services. I set up a Jabber server with two-factor authentication once. So anything that you need to do, you can probably find a free and open source version that supports PAM authentication. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a very simple setup. Um, we, uh, we'll, I'll just go through it and, and uh, we'll, we can, we can talk a little bit about the details, but it's, 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 it, it can be tough to set up. But it, at a basic level, it's pretty simple, right? Um, I typically download the source from the Free Radius homepage and do a config, make, make install. Um, there is a deb for Ubuntu, I know, um, but the, the compilation is pretty easy. And um, you get basically one shared object that gets put into lib slash security, and you get a configuration file. And in that configuration file, you put your three pieces of information. 
the, the, the server IP address, the shared secret, and a timeout. Um, you can chain these too, so you can have more than one, so if one fails, it'll go to the next one. Um, and then you edit your etsypan.d service file. And typically with something like auth sufficient, which means that if they pass the radius piece, that's all they need to do. Um, there are different options, include, required, requisite. Um, it is a little bit different across each distro, um, so it, there are complexities, but um, in general, it, it works pretty well. We did just figure out on Friday, I got a message from my CTO, that we had one customer that wanted to use both a one-time pass code and a uh, Kerberos request to uh, AD. So you would get two password prompts, and we figured that out. It was not, you know, it was not easy to do, but when you get it, it's, it's good to go. So you can do a lot with it. For example, you can set up OpenVPN. How many people have played with OpenVPN? How many people have deployed it internally at like an organization? Okay, good. Um, so uh, this is, you know, the, in, the, in the OpenVPN enterprise version, it's got radius support built in. So you can just drop in your, your um, IP address and shared secret and you're good to go. On the um, open source version, it's PAM support. And so you create your service file, uh, pretty much just a copy of the one we just did. On the client side, you, you tell the user to prompt for a uh, password. And on the server side, you tell it to use the, uh, the PAM plugin and tell it the name of the service file that you created. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Um, so the benefits of this is, once again, all your users are in the same place. And if HR fires somebody in accounting and deletes them out of your directory, they're no longer able to get in remotely. Um, yeah, you should not let your accounts pile up in other places, but in general, you know, deactivation is a very important thing. Um, additionally now, because you're using two-factor authentication for your identification, you can use the same cert for each user. So you no longer have to do the cert management piece. Your certs are only being used for encryption, so you can, um, you, you can get rid of that piece of management if you choose, or you can do belts and suspenders. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? Are you all hung over? Um, we get a lot of SSH uh, discussions, and one of our customers who managed a lot of boxes decided to set up an SSH gateway box. I thought it was a great idea. Um, they basically off all the users to the gateway box uh, via two-factor authentication. And that box is very well locked down, um, and they've got their keys on it there so they can manage all the other boxes from there. So they can go to the other boxes via basically a kind of SSH single sign-on, or they can run commands from that box across all the different servers. Um, there's no password file in the gateway box. Um, obviously, you need to be concerned about the keys, but that's about it. And if you're really concerned about the boxes they're working on, you could do sudo, uh, require sudo for a second one-time passcode. Um, <clears throat> with Wicked, you can actually do that via a separate domain. So you can have one um, Wicked domain to get a one-time password code for just the, the remote access and another one for sysadmin. <clears throat> I think this is a really important piece because attacks all involve escalation of privilege. And one of the things that I really like about Linux is the fact that you can do this with sudo. Uh, to my knowledge, you can't do that with run as on a Windows box. And it's all about slowing down the attacker, right? So when you start seeing, um, you know, pin attempts on a sudo protected box, that's going to be a big tip off. So <clears throat> one of the things I like to stress is that uh, if you can give the user something that they want and lock it down with more security, it's a win-win situation. And I think remote desktop is one of those things. Um, because if it's easy for them to get the same user interface that they do at work, at home, or wherever, that makes it easier for them. Um, FreeNX is, uh, well, No Machine is an Italian company. They released the NX protocol as open source. Um, and FreeNX is the result of that. It's in both, it's in all the repositories. It's a really awesome product. It's a little bit long in the tooth. Um, all of the bug fixes are now being done by the main maintainers, um, but it's pretty, you know, pretty rock solid and it works pretty well. There are a couple of newer projects out there, TACX and NEEDX. 
Needex is actually backed by Google. Um, I don't know, I don't really have an update on those projects. Um, but um, No Machine also has a commercial version. Uh, there's a free for two users, and if you really want some enterprise capabilities, it's a pretty reasonable price. Uh, what do you get with it? RemoteX, VNC, RDP, desktop sharing, session shadowing, you get quite a lot with it. And it's all tunneled through SSH, right? So again, you're using a very standard protocol for encrypting the tunnel, which is nice. And it uses PAM for authentication. So there you go, with a connection to PAM through your standard networking protocol. Um, we deployed this at a university that had their credit card processing services on Windows. <laughs> um, and so to me, it was a nice way for them to get secured access through VNC. It was actually a lot faster for them um, to do it. They later upgraded to a SSL-based VPN. Um, but again, that was an option for them that, you know, when they had the budget. And this was an option when they didn't. Um, here's a nice plug for Postgres, which I'm a big fan of. Um, you can actually have Postgres use PAM authentication. So if you have critical data in your database, you can lock it down via two-factor authentication. Again, imagine, you know, you have to come into the network with two-factor authentication. Maybe you have to sudo to get into it, but what you want to do is protect the data. And if the data's in Postgres, this would be a big tip-off for you, big help. Um, and there's a slight dig at MySQL. I don't know, I guess I'm bitter today. But MySQL does not support PAM. All right, the second tip is Apache. How many people know about Apache? <laughs> Good, just making sure you're awake. Um, I love Apache. Um, you know, it is, it is one of those things where there's a big honking config file, um, but it's pretty easy to configure. And if you get HTTP authentication working, you'll get a lot, right? So most content management systems, web dev, webmail, um, WordPress, uh, PHBB, uh, all of these, um, routinely attacked um, web applications can be protected with two-factor authentication. Um, on the Red Hat front and Fedora front, it is mod auth radius and mod auth x radius. You typically have to compile it um, from source, but it's not too bad. Uh, on Ubuntu, it's app get install lib apache mod auth radius, so it's quite easy. Um, Ubuntu on, uh, I mean, Apache on Ubuntu has two config files. In the first one, you tell it to use Radius, or you specify your Radius server, port, and shared secret, and a timeout. Um, and you set a cookie, because if you don't set a cookie, then each element of your page will be authenticated, and your one-time passcode will quickly fail, and your user will be disabled. Um, <clears throat> and then all you have to do is protect some area, right? Location, location uh, match, file match, directory, virtual host. Auth type basic, auth basic provider radius. I've got another example about LDAP too, but um, restart Apache and you're good to go. It's actually uh, very easy. As an example for WordPress, you know, they have an HTTP auth authentication um, plugin. So activate that. And if you want to just protect the administration, you protect WP login. Um, and WP admin, and that's all you need to do. And you know, most of the attacks against WordPress are to you know, post spam or malware uh, with admin, admin privileges. So this goes a long way to preventing that. Obviously, you still need to update your WordPress. This is one we recently did using mod auth LDAP. Um, you can tell there's a lot less simplicity here, but. Um, Secubus is an open source project for automating and managing your uh, scans. So it works with Nessus and OpenVAS and NITCO um, to um, you know, basically cron your scans and manage your logs. It's a pretty neat little project. It's on SourceForge. Um, and they're on Twitter at, at, at Secubus as well. Um, so, you know, this. One thing you don't want, I suppose, is a intruder getting uh, your scans from a place where you're allowing scans from. Uh, so locking it down with two-factor authentication, I think, is quite a good idea. This could be, you could sort of see this as being the open source Qualys. If, are you all familiar with Qualys? Qualys is a cloud-based um, vulnerability scanner. There's another one called NotSec as well. And I think, you know, with scanning, 
it, it's kind of a good idea to have multiple scans anyway, because different scanners will find different things. But again, automate it to keep it simple, and your life will be a lot easier. So, uh, how many people are doing, um, offering like Google Apps, or moving to Google Apps, or any kind of Salesforce type of, okay. So, um, One of the, th you know, again, with the idea of making your life simpler for your users while rolling out increased security, I think single sign-on is, is a big opportunity for that. Because, uh, you know, users are as tired of passwords as, as sysadmins are. Um, we were recently approached by a company called Atricore that manages and runs the JASO open source project, the Java open source single sign-on solution. Um, I've played with a number of open source solutions for SSO, like open, open SSO, which was the Sun one. Um, now with Rockforge and CAS, the um, CAS, I can't remember, Centralized Authentication Server. Uh, open source, the o open SSO one, I you know, got it spun up and running um, and couldn't figure it out. I mean, it was just so complex. And of course, you know, everything in, in identity has some very specific yet vague thing, right? So it's a service provider interface or it is an identity provider interface. And like, what, you know, what is the difference between those two things? <laughs> um, but OpenSSO, I just couldn't figure out at all. CAS actually got running once using Radius, but then couldn't get it running again. <laughs> um, with this, I was a basically able to spin up their um, identity appliance. It's a, a software download. It's OSGI based. Um, you get this um, GUI modeler, the console. I was able to create an identity provider. I used one of their built-in ID vaults, which instead of Active Directory, but that's where the users would go. I created a Tomcat test, and they actually, you can specify that it build, a, build an app. So it actually built the app for me to test on, and then I dropped in Wicked for two-factor authentication, and it was done. Um, it's, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of complexity because I think SSO does have its own language. Um, and, you know, if you're in a big enterprise, this is gonna get comp complex quickly. But it's, it was just a, an absolute breeze to get the base started. Um, and they've built in the, um, the, the connector there is actually our, um, using our WAuth protocol. So it is a, it's a, you get a network client on the Wicked server and you get a certificate. So it is SSL protected. So you could actually run your Wicked server back home. You could put this in the cloud if you wanted to and all of the authentication requests would be tunneled. Um, they've got built in support for Google Apps, Salesforce and Sugar CRM. Um, as well as, you know, all sorts of Apache, WebSphere, um, JBoss, Tomcat, stuff like that. So if you're running a lot of web apps internally um, or looking at moving externally, this is a great way to um, increase security and keep your users happy. Uh, I, a lot of people, I think, are going to be real nervous putting stuff on Google Apps and realizing that it's SSL and a username and password that's securing it. At the same time, I think a lot of enterprises are going to be more secure with that because, um, you know, securing an exchange server is um, difficult, in my opinion, because the exchange is sort of a piece of shit. Um, so, you know, that's it. I, you know, it's really a, um, you know, use, use standard tunnels, use two-factor authentication, uh, strategically choose a networking protocol, and try to think about making your, your users happy while increasing security, as well as the auditor. Any questions? Right. Yeah, so we've got a lot of, and also we do a lot on howtoforge.net as well. Um, so I've got a, so the tutorial for JASO is actually, um, uh, on how to forge, but we'll, we'll move it to our website as well. Um, and so all of the config files and like, you know, we, so we've got examples for um, Apache, I'm sorry, um, uh, PAM for Ubuntu and for Red Hat flavors um, and lots of stuff, a lot, in fact, a lot of it's a little bit old, but um, all of the how to information is there.
Um, what are my thoughts about Kerberos? Um, you know, it's, we don't, we don't use um, Active Directory internally, um, but it is, I think, a very good um, protocol, and you know, we don't support it in Wicked, um, but the way, the way it would really, uh, the way I would think about doing that is to find a Kerberos server that supported Radius as an authentication method. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, I have not found that. Um, the, are you running Kerberos as a directory server? Or are you, I mean, are you, are you running it internally to talk to AD or? Um, I guess my, my worry there is, you know, so what, what would you use, what are you using as a directory server? Uh-huh. Um, I would think a lot about what you want to authenticate to, because will, will your firewall talk Kerberos? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have to say that I, I, I haven't really looked at it that much. We probably haven't had too much call for it. So I'd be worried that is it, you know, is it really gonna be supported by our, um, by our, by the devices we wanna deploy? And that's why I find Radius to be a little bit, a little bit better. Um, but like I said, we've got this one customer that's doing both Radius and Kerberos, um, but they're just really using that to talk back to AD, I think. So they could just use LDAP as well. Is it supported under Mac, is Radius supported under Mac OS? Um, for what? PAM? Like are you talking about OS servers or? or I'm sorry, we're doing a, we're doing. Okay, so, so in other words, someone logs into a Mac um, and can they, can they then single sign on to your directory? Hmm. We don't do a lot with, um, like we're getting more and more questions about, hey, can you, can you change the window authentication? Um, and, you know, which basically means your a custom Gina. We don't do a lot of that. Um, there is a project called PGINA that, that, that will get, replace the GINA with something that will talk radius. Um, on the Mac front, I would think that if it's running, um, that if, if it's running PAM, that you could do that. Um, but I honestly don't know. I don't know. Any other questions? Yes? <laughs> Yes. Um, well, for one thing, on our, um, what, are our what, are, what, are, what are my reservations about TACX Plus? Um, on our side, our TACX interface is a little bit kludgy. Um, there, there's a open source TACX server project called, uh, at, I don't know what it's called, but um, it's called TAC Plus or something like that at shrubbery.net. And we're using their code to do our plugin. Um, but their code only works off of a configuration file. So it's meant for static passwords. So we rewrite that file every time someone requests a passcode. Um, and so what that means is that that passcode is actually valid until that, that file is overwritten. Right, so it's overwritten every minute or so, but technically it's not a one-time passcode. Um, so the lack of, because it's a proprietary protocol, there's a lack of open source solutions that support it. Um, that's, my, that's my big issue. Um, at the same time, I was, we, we did this with a customer um, that had a lot of devices they wanted to manage via TACX, they could only do it via TACX, and basically he said we had by far the best TACX interface and server and support than, any, than anything he'd ever seen. Um, you know, you can actually, you can put in custom um, information into the file as well, um, you know, 
apparently it's the best thing since you know sliced bread, but um, and we just don't we don't see it a lot. Any other questions? Are y'all familiar? Are y'all following the lull sec security on Twitter? You know who L L U L Z security? They just uh, hacked a bunch of porn sites, posted the admin passwords and everyone's username and emails, including a number of .mil and .gov email addresses. Um, and they're doing it just for fun. Just for the lulls. Um, what else? Is everybody familiar with the RSA breach? Or has no one heard about the RSA breach? Has someone not heard about the RSA breach? So uh, RSA um, is the leading provider of hardware tokens, 40 million of them. Uh, they take a, the hardware is basically a shared secret system. So there's a shared secret. There's an algorithm which is known. It's a, I think it's based on AES. And the time, it takes those things and, and generates a six digit random, random number. Um, on the server side, there is the, the, the shared secret, the same algorithm and the time. You know, they, if, the, if the time gets lost, there's offsets and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> RSA maintains a copy of these seeds. Um, I have read that that's for um, probably recovery capability, but also licensing. <clears throat> Someone which they termed as an advanced persistent threat, which means the Chinese, um, <clears throat> fished, spearfished one of their users. Uh, the user actually got a Excel file out of the spam folder and opened it up. It had a zero day. Uh, they then um, escalated into an admin account and got information that was said to reduce the effectiveness of Secure ID. Um, but that it was, they felt because it was um, limited to specific targets, uh, they told everyone not to panic. Um, except for those targets. Uh, you can only find out details about the uh, breach by signing an NDA. Uh, lo and behold, um, a couple weeks ago, Lockheed Martin um, shut down the remote access, uh, issued new passwords to everybody, and didn't say much about it, but then issued new security tokens. Uh, then L3, another large defense contractor, was attacked. They said it was their, based on their RSA uh, keys. And then Northrop Grumman said, oh, they were attacked as well. Um, and I guess it just didn't occur to anybody that um, if RSA was keeping copies of the seeds, they were also part of the threat landscape. Um, RSA has said that you can request to replacement tokens, um, and some people are doing that, uh, or, you know, um, and I guess some people are switching. But, you know, the, the, the premise that only certain people will be attacked by this, I think, is, is misleading at best because if I were the Chinese, I'd be saying, okay, let's cover our tracks here. Let's get some plausible den deniability by sharing this with the hacker underground and getting some other attacks going. Um, you know, or if it's, uh, you know, and, and I don't know why you would replace the same architecture. Um, you know, because basically what RSA is going to say now is, you know, we're, it'll never happen again. We got a new, we got a hardware security module now, and it's got, we got this, awesome half million dollar or whatever hardware security knowledge and everyone's like, what were you using before? You know? My guess is it was on a Windows machine. Um, so it's, it's interesting times. Is everyone familiar what's going on with Sony? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sony has been, the PlayStation Network has been down for months now, it seems like. So. PlayStation Network is back up everywhere except for Japan. Yeah, Protecting their own, I guess. Any other questions? Okay. Uh huh. Oh God. Yeah.
Right. 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 So if you don't, if you, if you, we'll just call the talk over and, and, now, and welcome to the wicked sales pitch. Um, so um, we have um, two versions. We have an enterprise version and a commercial and an open source version. The difference is in the in the enterprise version, we use third party libraries for a couple of things. Um, one is the radius interface, and the other one is the encryption um, that we use for the wireless tokens. So we have PC tokens that are open source um, uh, for Mac. Linux and Windows. Um, another company, Hurricane Labs, wrote their, wrote their own in Python um, to use for, because they used a lot of SSH. So you can feel free to write your own. Um, then we have iPhone, iPad, um, Android, um, Windows Mobile, but we are, we're currently rewriting to upgrade to Windows Mobile 7, and J2ME. Um, and they use a third party encryption library that is blindingly fast. Um, <clears throat> The server is, um, you know, we've got RPMs, uh, we have DEBs, and we have an ISO. Um, and the ISO basically is for the, well, it's, it's easy, but it's also geared towards the Windows admin person who doesn't really know Linux. You run a setup, give it, a, give it an IP address, it's got everything you need, and then it's a web interface from there on out. Um, the server supports LDAP, Radius, TACAX, and then we have an API that's very simple. Um, but very powerful for multi-tenant solutions. So like uh, we are seeing a lot more, um, <clears throat> Nopsec is a Qualys competitor that does scanning and they're running it um, in the cloud and you can actually build applications to allow other management of users by your customers. Um, it's, um, we, we price it on a per user per year subscription with a three year discount option and you know, support it and all that stuff. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but undoubtedly it would work with your software. Download it, play with it, give us feedback. We never used SMS. Um, yeah, um, we, you know, we look, so we, we looked at using SMS and like wouldn't that be easy, but there was really no way to guarantee the security of it um, because you don't really know if it's encrypted. And you know, the, um, the, the carriers are not incented in any way to add encryption to their SMS messages. Um, so you face issues around, um, you know, the client, uh, the carrier, the carrier's admin, um, you know, the, the, the ability for the carrier to manage their users. Um, we've always used uh, public key encryption with the keys generated on the device. We actually started out with those old Nextel Java phones. You know, Nextel had the first, talk about a great company that got killed. Um, Nextel had a great system with Java phones. They even had an app store. It had enterprise class capabilities for managing it. That was our first um, um, device. So when the so the way it works is that the, the, the you know the public private key pairs are generated on the device. There's a key pair exchange, and then the user sets their PIN, and they get back a registration code. So the the the, the account's created on the on the on the server, but it's not. There's no username associated with it. After the key pair after that, they if once that registration code comes back to the server in some form or fashion, either you know either the admin says hey yes this is the user. Or the user goes in, we, we actually provide some scripts where the user can log in with Active Directory credentials on the LAN and give the registration code and then register their own tokens. Each user can have more than one token, right, because this is public private key pairs. So you can have more than one token, um, which is kind of nice. We spend a lot of time working on making it easy for you to um, create new users and manage users, because that's really a lot of the expense around two-factor authentication.
How many people have, have deployed two-factor authentication? Let's get that number, let's get that number up. Anything else? Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.